take me out to the ball game Take me out with a crowd Buy me some peanuts and cracker jack So to help us understand the importance of baseball on the Eastern Shore and to help us get a sense of uh, just how important a part it was of small communities, we have a panel tonight that consists of two community historians who are truly expert in, uh, in this subject and two former players. So I'm going to introduce each one and then at the end if we could give them a, a good welcome. Um, we'll proceed that way. Uh, let's see, Mr. Don Davidson. Uh, he is an avid collector of Eastern Shore baseball memorabilia. He is a historian, in particular, of the Class D leagues of the early and mid 20th century. And he has been uh, putting on exhibits in, uh, for uh, historical societies and, and small communities since 1976. Uh, and really, ranging the, the peninsula from Chestertown to, to Salisbury. He has an upcoming one in Dorchester County. So Mr. Davidson is one of our community historians. Mr. Teddy Evans, uh, third, third from where I'm standing. He played and managed in the Central Shore League from 1948 to 1959. He played for Pocomoke, Princess Anne, Frederica Delaware, Delmar, Hebron, and Mardella. And if I left out anything, please forgive me. But uh, that's, uh, that's what I was able to find. Uh, also, he managed the Hebron baseball team in 1959, uh, and apparently also was playing for Pocomoke at the time. Uh, Dr. Kirkland Hall is also a former player. Uh, he played for, at the end of the table, he played for the Oaksville Eagles in the Negro League for many years, and then in the Central Shore League. Uh, he went on to uh, uh, then be a coach for the University of Maryland Eastern Shore baseball team. And today he is well known for his efforts to preserve the history of the Oaksville Eagles. And just yesterday, he was honored for his work by the Lower Eastern Shore Heritage Council. I was there, I got to see it. But uh, that's, uh, he's been in the news quite a bit in the past few years for efforts to restore the stadium or re restore the ballpark and for um, a number of exhibits that he has put on. And there's a sampling of the Oaksville exhibit right over there to the left side of the room. And then finally, Mr. Marty Payne, two, two gentlemen from me here. Uh, he is an authority on Eastern Shore baseball with a particular interest and expertise in the very early period, the 19th century. He also regularly attends meetings of the Society for American Baseball Research, SABRE. And this is an organization that promotes the study of anything connected to American baseball, running from history all the way to the really intricate world of data analysis and, and how that might be brought to bear on the game today. Um, so please join me in welcoming our panel. So I really would like for this to become a conversation of sorts. I do have a few questions that I'll, that I'll ask here to, to, so we can hear a little bit about some of the older history and then we'll um, hopefully get into um, some, just some good dialogue. So um, I, just to get some sense of uh, the history of Eastern Shore baseball. And by the way, the clip, uh, the film clip, clip that was playing at the beginning, that was from 1927. That is an item that we have in our archives. Uh, it was a film, a, a literal film uh, set that came to us, and we were able to digitize it, and it featured a baseball game between the, between the Salisbury team and Cambridge. And tonight, some of our uh, experts determined that it was indeed here in Salisbury at Gordy, at Gordy Field. So anyway, we hope to learn a lot more. But uh, Mr. Payne, I wanted to start with you. Um, it, so if you could give us a couple of minutes or, or you know, the time that you need to tell us a bit about the earliest origins of Eastern Shore baseball. Well, the earliest origins, it, a specific date of 1866 is when baseball comes to the Eastern Shore. Uh, and it's through the efforts of one man, a guy named George Gratton from Baltimore. He was selling equipment, so he thought the Eastern Shore was a right market. And uh, the thing that made it possible was the network of new railroads on the Eastern Shore combined with the 
steamboat travel. Um, and it, it caught on very quickly. I, I always compare it to uh, like rock and roll where, you know, it was, it was a fad, some liked it, some didn't, um, um, but it stuck around apparently. Uh, and very quickly baseball became the center of uh, social events on the Eastern Shore. Uh, games weren't that frequent, they drew large people. I think there was a game here in Salisbury that drew 2,500 people and there probably wasn't 2,000 people in Salisbury at the time. Um, you know, Federalsburg, same thing uh, in the 1880s. They actually charged the same price as a, um, a major league team and drew 1,000 people. And Federalsburg didn't have 1,000 people there. So it was a big event. Um, they competed with camp meetings. I mean, that was the only other comparable uh, thing that was happening. And of course, religious revival camp meetings, they would draw a couple thousand. Um, so it really quickly became an, an integral part of the community. And it became a, uh, you had town teams, there wasn't one owner, everybody was involved. You had a board of directors, business contributed, ladies auxiliaries. Um, it, it was a big event. And uh, it didn't take long for people to start going over to Baltimore or Philadelphia and start paying people to come down and play. And that's when they started to become professional by the 1890s. People on the Eastern Shore took their baseball seriously. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, Mr. Davidson, going into the end of the 20th century, um, if you could help take us into that era, and then and any anyone that wants to chip in is, is yeah. fine as well. But uh, going into into the last century, uh, were there key changes or anything like that? Well, the Eastern Shore League started in uh, the Class D started in 1922, and uh, uh, and it went to 1928, and then they ran into some financial problems, and, and they didn't have some attendance problems and everything. But uh, uh, in in 1923, well, 1922, uh, they. They had, uh, um, like, uh, um, at the end of the year, they would have a, uh, a championship with the other Class D league up in uh, uh, Martinsburg, uh, West Virginia, and, and, uh, and Frederick, and Hagerstown, those, those teams. Uh, um, and they called it the Five State Series, and it was, it was done by uh, the Baltimore Sun. But... Uh, uh, the, the commissioner of baseball got got uh, tabs on that, and uh, uh, he came down. And they in 1923, July 19th, 1923, they had a Landis Day. The Eastern Shore League did right here in Salisbury, and uh, uh, and he came down. And uh, Cambridge played Laurel, and and uh, he came down for that. And that was a right big event until. Uh, for for the first installment of the league, the second installment of the league was was when uh, uh, the the first uh, uh, year was 1937. They played from 37 to 41, and then they they got into some war problems, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, what it was was uh, um, the 1937. Uh, there was a fellow named Jake Flowers who uh, was from the shore. And he, he came, uh, uh, he, was, he was born in Cambridge, and he, he played for the Canners in 1922 and actually led the Eastern Shore League in, in home runs that year. He had 14. But uh, uh, he was the manager. When he came back, he played in two World Series for the Cardinals in 1926 and 1931. And, and uh, uh, when he came back home, he... Uh, uh, he was named the manager of the Salisbury team, the Salisbury Indians in 37. And that was, uh, that went down as one of the, the greatest minor league teams of all time. Uh, and, and what happened was, was they had a, a um, they were, they were 25, they were 21 and five. And, uh, um, and then they had, there was a league rule where you could only have three, they called them class players. And the class players was, uh, uh, was somebody who played at a higher league for like 25 games. And then 
you know, you could only have three of those players because it was a rookie league, you know. So what happened was um, <laughs> boy, that uh, of uh, um, well, they forfeited all the games. And... Well, well, th what happened was they had this other guy named Bob Brady, and Bob Brady was the guy that uh, um, that was the fourth man that they considered class a class player, but he really. He was at, at a higher league, but he never played a game for him. He was hurt. And uh, what happened was they, they, were, they took all the games, and, and the president of the league at that time was a guy named Tom Kibler from up Washington College. And, and uh, Kibler uh, was, was friends with uh, uh, Jake Flowers because Jake Flowers played for him as a, as a player at Washington College. But uh, what happened was uh, um, they took all the games. He, he ruled all the games. Was, so they were 0-26. And, and then they came back and they won 48 of their next 58 games and, and beat Easton in the last week to, uh, to win the championship. They had a guy named Joe Coleman that was – he was 25-1 and that year. And, uh, and then – they had to play Centerville for the playoffs, and they beat Centerville in the last game of the playoffs. Uh, Joe Coleman pitched a no-hitter. So, uh, and that went down as, as one of the, the greatest minor league teams in the history of baseball. I, th I think uh, there's a, a website that names the top 100, and it's like number eight. Okay. You know. So that was one of my – one of my questions you just answered there were there teams that uh, that were dominant during this period. And we can go back to uh, yeah. to you, Mr. Pan, anyone that wants to contribute. But well, we can think of different periods in Major League Baseball where where a team really sort of dominated a decade. Was that ever the case with these leagues? Well, well the the major towns of Easton and Salisbury and Cambridge during say 1900 to 1922. Um, they were dominant because they had the most money, and that, okay. that's how it worked. It, um, uh, but every once in a while, I mean, even the smallest villages had professional teams. I, I, I think Crumpton, which is northern towards um, Chestertown, they described the team as a pitcher from Philadelphia, a catcher from Baltimore, and a team from God knows where. Let's put this back over. Um, a team from God knows where. So they <clears> – <throat> and Crumpton's probably about 500 people. Even today, I mean, it's just not a, not a large area. So um, sometimes a very small town like Sudlersville could dominate. Um, and it, in fact, Sudlersville one year played for Sudlersville, and then I think Snow Hill couldn't beat Salisbury, so they just hired a whole team from Sudlersville to come down and play. You know, put them in Snow Hill uniforms and um, let them play. Um, but primarily, it was the larger towns with the larger money that could afford the, the bigger talent. Just kind of like the major leagues today, to a certain right, degree, okay. you know. So, um, but that—that's a period where there was a lot of good players. Uh, they were independent of organized baseball, but um, uh, a lot of guys started. Frank Baker, you know, started in 1905 in Ridgely, uh, and played in Cambridge, and I think it was 07, 07. Uh, he also played for East in 1915. He set out in a contract dispute. And, you know, here's a guy that's going to be, go to the Hall of Fame, and he's um, right 29 years old, and he's not playing in the major leagues. He's playing, you know, he's, he's playing for Easton in a, in a league. So um, there were a lot of good players during that, that era. And I'm curious about the management of these teams. And, I mean, and just the general, you, you've been talking about funding for yeah. them and support, and but were most of these players also working other jobs and the managers, were they doing the same or how did that work? And then the players, you can speak to that uh, in, in a minute also, but how did that work in this early, early period? Uh, I, I think most of the local players, you know, had their jobs, they were getting, they were getting paid so much and the managers were usually local guys, so, you know, they had jobs. Um, but when they brought in somebody from um, out, of, out of town to play, they, you know, they might play on a season contract, they might play on a game contract. And some guys would, would play for one team 
<clears throat> one game and then you, you'd see them uh, next week, they're playing for the other team against <laughs> the team they had pitched for earlier. So it, it was a pretty fluid um, situation for them. And those guys, they didn't have to work. You know, they, they, they were hot, hired guns, you know. Um, so, and they could get paid a lot of money. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just noticed that the, when, when <clears throat> the first iteration of the Eastern Shore Baseball League went defunct basically in 1928, it, it's not quite yet the Depression, but it's, it's very close. And you mentioned attendance had dropped a bit right. and um, there were some, some funding issues. Was it connected at all to a larger economic? I mean, do you know? It's fine. No. I, you, okay. I, uh, but I do know, I have a letter home the last day, and it tells about how that uh, that they just don't have the money. You know, the teams didn't have the money, and, and the league didn't have the money at that time. You know, they just didn't, didn't have it. Okay. And I'm also assuming um, that during periods where there was not an organized uh, league, that baseball was still a passion for the communities. I, I, I don't know if any of you can speak to that, but I, my sense is people didn't just stop playing baseball altogether. There, there were probably um, equivalent of youth leagues and you, that sort of play throughout, I'm assuming. They, they had a lot of uh, uh, town ball teams that was as big a rival as anything okay. going in, in, uh, in, in 1936. Uh, um, um, Phillips Packing Company was playing the Coca-Cola team in Cambridge, and uh, um, Phillips won the first two games. It was a seven-game series, and in the third game, the Coca-Cola team didn't have any of the players. They were all different faces. So the the guy that owns Phillips Packing Company, he went out and got Jimmy Fox and Dick Porter, and and I mean he talked to. He was friends with Jake Rupert, who was the owner of the Yankees, and and he went out and he got everybody that everybody that played was was playing either minor league ball or or, or major league ball. Everybody that played that day, you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, I came across some of the first youth teams in 1867. Okay. And they started early. And they had a lot of towns, particularly the bigger ones, might, might have four or five levels. Um, you know, eight, nine, ten, twelve, and, and uh, on up. It, it, so there was, they weren't formerly little little league, but they had youth teams, and okay. people were sort of grooming a feeder system, I guess. Interesting. For the bigger teams, yeah. Now we figure for for communities to be able to support professional type play, there must be a, an inherent and strong love of the game at, at all levels. So. That's what it sounds like. I want to talk with the, the players, uh, move towards, towards your end for a few minutes. What, did you feel any particular attachment to the, the communities where your teams played? Now, oh, today yeah. we're so, we, we associate oh, trading with uh, baseball today, but oh, if you could speak to that. Let me tell you, every town had a team. Princess Anne, Chris Field, Snow Hill, Pokemo, and uh, that's before the Orioles came in. I mean, late 40s and, and uh, uh, it was nothing. I, I managed uh, played for Hebron. It was nothing to have 1,400, 2,000 people at Hebron. And had, on a ball game, we played Princess Anne at Chrisfield, and there were 2,000 people in the whole town. But uh, it was nothing else to do before the Orioles. The Orioles came in. They took a lot, a little delay. But baseball was a, a hot item on Delmar Peninsula. Mm -hmm. uh, I played the Princess Anne, and they had such a good team. Dick Porter said. Uh, he was in professional baseball at Fall Rivers. He says he told Bill Cook, "You got a Class B ball club here at Princess Anne, and I was a pretty good ball player there. And I couldn't play, so uh, he used to hitchhike to Frederica, Delaware, every weekend and play for Frederica. And I'll brag a little bit. I won the batting title up there, <laughs> and I'll come back down here and won the batting title down here. So uh, nobody loved the game more than me, and and." Uh, I will say I'm a proud person. I coached and managed two guys who played in the big leagues, made it and played in big club. One of them, Costy Chalky, got going. I don't know the amount, but he got seventy or ninety thousand dollars signed with the Phillies, mm -hmm. and I won the batting title. Something wrong with that puzzle. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but he's—I was, was over the hill. And he was just started, but he's a real close friend of mine. Still is, and uh, but uh, I will talk. 
I don't know if any of you, all of you, been through the baseball museum at the Strawberry Stadium. People come up on each side of us and miss it. If you come in the main corridor, the office here, uh, and believe me, if you've ever been there, we have one of the best baseball museums in the whole country. I've been to Cooperstown, I've been to Ty Cobb Museum at Royal Georgia, I've been to all of them, and I think East Shore Baseball Hall of Fame is equivalent to any of them. We got some stuff that Cooperstown would love to have because a lot of guys from the Delmar Peninsula played in the big leagues. Home Run Baker, Jimmy Fox, Bill Nicholson, Gene Corbett, Steve Bilko, you name it. And uh, the Delmar Peninsula was a uh, baseball hotbed. That's uh, because that's all it was to do. There was no bridge that you had to get in a ferry to go to Baltimore so people come over here to stay here. And um, it, uh, I get a little enthused about talking about it, but if you got people got about, come to our baseball museum at the Shorebird Stadium. I hope I'm there to give you a tour, <laughs> and you will be impressed. It's one of the best baseball museums, and I've been to all of them, and, and I, I agree. Uh, Vince Bagley, the great sports nerd in Baltimore, we have a banquet every year, and I picked him up at the airport and checked him in at the uh, hotel and took him to the baseball museum. Now, I'm on the board of directors now, and he's our guest speaker at the museum, at people at the Civic Center. I think it was 1,400, 2,000. And guess what? We were late, 20 minutes late, getting to the banquet. And uh, I couldn't get him out of the museum. He said, this is better than Cooperstown. <laughs> and uh, just if you yeah. like baseball, you know a friend likes it, call us and go through the BC Shore Baseball Hall of Fame. You will not be disappointed. Thank that, you for your time. That's a good endorsement, and I agree. <laughs> so, Dr. Hall, can you tell us about your experiences? And, and again, I, I'd ask about, you know, affinity for the town where you played and, and attachment. Don't tell them how old we are. If we play to get to you. <laughs> no problem. Uh, <clears throat> the Oaks Eagles baseball team uh, is very unique uh, from the other leagues in the area, other teams in the area. A little place called Oaksville. At the peak, uh, the population might have been 80, 85 people in the community. Uh, how this team actually got started, had an uncle by the name of Joseph Mil George Milburn, who was a businessman. And his wife, my aunt, traveled to Pennsylvania and to Philadelphia and also to uh, Pittsburgh to work. And they used to realize. And evidently, she saw some guys uh, playing baseball in the field, and came back and told Uncle George, and he contacted all of her brothers, Uncle Rob and Uncle Oliver, my grandfather. And uh, they just started playing baseball. Fell in love with it, and it just became a tradition. But the problem was, this was in 1910. So those guys, I mean, they were visionaries. But what happened, it was difficult for them to find teams to play. So there was another community south of Oakville called Dublin. And while they were working, they'd argue about baseball. Dublin didn't have a team. According to my uncle, he said, they said that we could get a team together and beat y'all don't have practice. So then the team Dublin played Oaksville. I know for a fact because my mother played on the, the female team. And she said her team always beat Oaksville, so uh, the must have some pretty good prospects. So anyway, uh, fast forward just a little. Every young man in that community, the desire was to play baseball. We became so strong, we had two teams. And they were basically family teams. I had three brothers. My uncle Milton had four boys. My cousin William had six boys. My cousin Elton had Eight boys, uh, the Haywards, that were six boys, and, it, uh, and everyone wanted to play baseball. But one of the saddest things that I recall, some guys who didn't make the team still have a bad taste in their mouths <laughs> because they couldn't they could wear Donna Oaksville baseball uniform. But the community adopted the team. Everywhere we traveled, they would go. And there was a gentleman, and his name was Theo Apple Jones, called Three Apple Jones, rather. Really, it was Theodore. Couldn't talk. But any time he found out Oaksville had a game, he was always there. 
Sometimes we pass him in prison at that stoplight. And we get to Dover, Delaware, he's there waiting on us. And we're still today trying to figure out how he did that. But we had a great following and people in the community loved the team. And small baseball field, but it was always packed. Every Sunday, uh, they let Teddy play with him one, one time. They, they felt sorry for him because nobody wanted him on the other team. That did, so. it, it wasn't that. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sam, he'll take Sam Dunn Coleman. <laughs> And I was playing for Herbert, Kenny Green, I do that he said, ball. Teddy, he'll remember, he said, Teddy, we're playing the Jersey City Giants or something, a doubleheader at Oaksville. He said, my old men, they can't play a doubleheader. So he said, I would get you and Kenny Green, I, we left Hebron and That's went down and played it. second base and shortstop for That's Oaksville. It. And they were the only two. Huh? You were, they were the only two whites <laughs> that played on the team for yeah. a number of years <laughs> until my later years. Yeah. So that was a comment to Teddy and um, – now, we, our Central Shore League, excuse me, we used to play them an all-star game every year. You know, she said all-star game. <laughs> They'd have all-star team, and we at Oaksville. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> but they always, you know, we always had a good time. It's, it's a baseball community. I'll tell you one thing. It's uh, people love. Now, how far did your team travel in, in oh, its uh, – we're just finding other teams. To play. And I'm trying to understand yeah. how we you know the New, uh, New Jersey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand Wildwood, New Jersey, Salem, New Jersey, Norfolk, Virginia, of course, Baltimore, Annapolis, or Philadelphia. And I often wonder how do we find the money? And the chapter to get to those places. We didn't get the bus. And everybody, the, the men that worked on that played on the team years ago were laborers. And they get off work, they're Friday, I guess they practice a little bit. And they travel uh, 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 that Sunday morning and to play baseball. And I often wonder how would, were we able to do that uh, with the little pen, a few pennies we had. But we got to those places. So we traveled all over these coasts. Okay. Now, you said the original owner of who put up some money for back, you said 1910? Yes. Yeah, Michael okay. George Milburn. Where, where was he? Was he from Princess Anne or? Well, his, he, he was a business person, had a little two, two or three small stores around Somerset County. But he married my great aunt. Okay. And uh, so he moved to Oaksville. And when the team needed a few pennies, he would always go in his pocket okay. to, to support the team, buy uniforms, whatever we needed. And could you give us a sense of, I know it's on Perry Hawkins Road, but how, how far outside of Princess Anne? Five is miles. That? Five miles. Five miles outside of Princess Anne. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. So um, this was, I mean, you, you summarized that very well. It was a purely local team. There yes. were not people brought in from the outside. Okay. Only Very. Ted, no. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. And Excuse me. They do have a national uh, monument that uh, recognize the Oaksville baseball community. Historic uh, market. Yes. I know. I've it's, seen it's that. It's just been erected the last couple of years, so you ought to go to see it. Now, if we could talk about, uh, we, we've mentioned rivalries a couple of times up here, but for, for each of you, were there particular rivalries that stand out? And do you remember how they started? <laughs> do you know where they came from? Uh, sometimes rivalries are hard to find the origins of, but uh, for, for either or for both of you. Oh, well, Princess Anne played Chrisfield. I'm telling you right now, more money past stands than you got. You can't believe it. Not the players, but okay. uh, all the business oh, no. people. Uh, they bet big money. Yeah. I remember Rusty Evans, no relation to me, he was a great player. Uh, I was just coming out of high school and played Princess Anne. Rusty had a home run for Princess Anne to beat Chrisfield, and uh, it passed the hat around the stadium, around the uh, baseball park. And I can't say exactly, but it was well over a thousand dollars that he got. Okay. Yeah, because they bet more money. They bet more money than <laughs> they didn't mind putting the donation. But uh, Rusty Evans, uh, I wish I could say he was related to me, but he's not. But what a player! Dick Porter says uh, he come down here. Rusty was working for uh, Wayne Pump Dressway, and Rusty Evans, now local, Dick Porter wanted to take him right from Salbert to AAA, bypass the C, D, E, and uh, up uh, D, C, B, and A, and AAA, take him right to the thing. And, and Rusty didn't want to leave uh, Bill Allen. So that's the truth. He, he was attached. Okay. Well, player. Well, I, and, and Nick, really, I, I don't think that was really a rival per se. However, uh, it was always a rival when played against the, the white teams. And that's when Oaksville was, was full, especially when they came to our, our baseball park. But the only team that I know of that uh, 
we look forward to playing every year was a team out of House from Delaware called the House from Cubs. Okay. And their start was very similar to Oaks Eagles, but they didn't play as long as we did. And uh, we had a 48 game win streak. And they came to Princess Anne, and everybody in that little town in the House in Delaware was in Oaksville that Sunday. And I meant to tell you, uh, in order to play Oaksville baseball team, you had to go to church. So the only time you'd have to go to church when you traveled. Okay. But if it was a home game, you had to go to church. So we put our uniforms in the back of my father's old jalopy, and so when the preacher stopped preaching, we ran and we went for the benediction. We ran up, put the uniforms on, and ran to the baseball field, which was not far from the, uh, of the church. But that, and they beat us, uh, five to four, and it broke out Wind Street, and this guy named Luke Alberton, I'll never forget him, they treat them just like he won the World Series. Everybody put them on his shoulders, they ran around our field, came to our dugout, and um, it was, it was humiliating, <laughs> but it was a, a, a good game. That's the only rivalry that I can think of that we had. Again, we just wanted to play baseball. Okay. Very good. And could you, I, I might have, I should have maybe asked this at the beginning, could you tell us a little bit about your, your, your technical, I mean, the positions you played and anything you want to tell us about uh, batting? I should have asked that early on. Well, I played uh, every position. However, I was not a good outfielder. Uh, but I played caught, pitch, first, second, third, okay. short. Uh, my father was a shortstop. Uh, when he uh, got up in age, my young brother Kim, who was drafted by the Baltimore Orioles in 1972, he was one of the, he was the second player drafted uh, from that team, Uncle Milton, uh, back in the 40s, and was drafted also for baseball. He was the first African American to work for the state roads in Somerset County. And he was getting paid more than what the team offered him, I think like $15 a week or something like that. And he was making more than that on state roads, so he, did, he chose not to go. But um, uh, I never did like shortstop because everyone always compared me to my older brother, Kim. Okay. In high school, when he left high school, I ended up playing shortstop. Went to the same college, UMES. We left in college, I moved to shortstop. And I, my favorite position was catching. Okay. That's what I always wanted to do, and I ended up late in my career. Uh, that's basically uh, what I did. Okay. Mr. Evans? Uh, I'll tell you a war story, you may not believe it, but it's the truth, I never moved this spot. <laughs> <laughs> I was the batting title down there, down there up in Bardell League at Frederica. I come down here, won the batting title of Central League. And uh, so Gene Carver signed me and I go down to Albany, Georgia with the Cardinals. That's where they, every team, major leagues, A, triple A, they all they had but 10 or 12 baseball dimes at Albany then. I went through there not long ago and reminisced a little bit. But anyway, Stan Musical, Ina Slaughter, Joe Torrey, third baseman then, Red Changing. Teddy Evans ate breakfast with him. You think I ought to got an autograph? Not a one. I thought he'd ask me for mine. <laughs> <laughs> if I got an autograph from all then, how much money would I be worth today? I've done it. But anyway, uh, nobody enjoyed the game more than me, and uh, I can say I coached two guys who made it to the big leagues and played in the big leagues. There ain't too many guys can say that. And, uh, uh, Baseball being good to me and, and what position uh, did you play? Huh? What position did you play? I played short. short yeah. Very, very good. Nobody enjoyed it more than me. Nobody hustled more than me. And uh, that's why I don't go to the game now. They sit there and, oh. and want you to thank them for going to see them play. Get a life. <laughs> half of the guy half of the guys in the half of the guys, you know, half of the guy wasn't even been invited to spring training in the fifties. We only you know, had 20 major league teams. Now we've got 60 major league teams. And oh, if I'd be in the big leagues tomorrow, if I was coming along today with 40 major league teams, they can't play a lick. And I'm going to ride all the way to Baltimore to see them? I don't think so. Well, I'm not going up to see ball players doing good as so, I used to be. I got his show birds. Do we have Mauricio of the Eastern Shore? What a player. So, so back in the day when it was good, what, what were some, who were some big, and, and everyone can contribute on this. Um, there were some pretty big names that came from well, the Jimmy Eastern Fox, Shore. Jimmy Fox, Bill Nicholson, uh, uh, Dick Porter, Dick Porter from down here to Allen. Oh, he was a great international league player. 
but he come along with uh, Bruce and Garrick, and they didn't know who Dick Porter was. If he was coming along there, he'd owned the whole town of Cleveland. He had about, like Tom Batten, every 309 for about 14 years. And they don't, you go to, who was Dick Porter? Because he was up there with Ruth and Garrick and Missouri and all them great players. And uh, there were some great players around the league, but uh, if, if you didn't play in New York, uh, you know, they, they didn't know who you were. Yeah. So, but anyway, uh, but I want to tell everybody, anybody you know likes baseball, bring them to the Eastern Shore Baseball <laughs> Museum at Shorebird Stadium. And I hope I can give them the tour. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hay, were you going to say something? I, well, I was going to add that uh, in the uh, early minor leagues, you had guys like Mickey Cochran and uh, Red Ruffing, I think both made the Hall of Fame. They were in the early years. Uh, before that, you had home run Baker, naturally, and guys like Homer Smoot, Buck Herzog, who were solid players and managers uh, that came up when they were independent around here. Yeah, Carl Farillo and Mickey Vernon both won batting titles, played on, on Class D here, um, 30s and 40s. And uh, so there were a lot of lot of players. Came down. I know there's at least 50 before even the minor leagues started. Um, and then after that, there's probably about 150 or 100 that played in the Class D. Dr. Let me, uh, Teddy mentioned, and I don't usually mm -hmm. like to toot my horn. <laughs> But uh, I, I can say uh, uh, I was a two-time batting champion in high school, my junior year and senior year. And this was prior to integration of schools. So I was not awarded the batting champion my junior and senior year. Uh, in college, I did lead the uh, admitting athletic conference in baseball, batting one year. I played against guys like Al Brumley. I, I played against um, Willie Mays Aikens. And uh, those are two of the names that I, I, I can call. But I did, was very blessed to coach a young man by the name of Ira Dew Smith. He was from Kent County High School. <coughs> Dude was a two-time NCAA batting champion, drafted by the Los Angeles Dodgers. But he made one major mistake. He was in the minors, leading the league in batting during the strike season. They offered him $10,000 to play uh, the weekend series against the Giants. Coming from a poor family, and it, he didn't see anything illegal about playing in, in that, uh, during that, that series. Uh, he played, did exceptionally well, but he got blackballed for Major League Baseball. And the Sports Illustrated wrote an article that he was one of the best players to play in the minors to not get a fair shot in the pros. He was just good. As a matter of fact, he played in Eastern Shore Baseball League a, a couple of years. He was just that good a player. Matter of fact, Ryan Thompson, who played with the Nets, they went to, I'm sorry, the um, Mets, right? They went to the same high school. Yeah. Ryan uh, chose not to do it, and, but Ira did. And of course, uh, he's, he's coaching and teaching baseball now, but uh, uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago, and he's, he regret that point. But a young man, you know, small country town, and finally got opportunity. You're going to get paid for something you enjoy, but he didn't recognize the, the, the big picture. And I don't think none of us did, that he'd get black ball for the major leagues. Okay. Thank you. I just have a couple, couple more questions. Um, uh, Dr. Hall, I've read that in some of the preservation, preservation work that you've done uh, regarding the Oaksville Eagles, that it was the only team, African-American team, that played in the Central Shore League after desegregation. What, what does that, how did desegregation of the leagues work? What did that mean for the Negro League? It, it was Eastern Shore Baseball League. What happened Sorry. Uh, in 1978, uh, that's when our team folded, finances. We could not afford to travel. Uh, it was tough. We didn't have a sponsor. Every player bought their own uniforms, on, our own equipment. And we got an invitation for Eastern Shore Baseball League uh, to join uh, the league. And we were excited. And we really found out what baseball was all about in that league. Because we played two games on Friday, I'm sorry, two games on Saturday, and two games on Sunday. This was an area which a number of young players moved away from the area. They moved out of Preston moved out of Somerset County. So we were left with maybe 
13, 14 baseball players, but they were not as talented as the young men that left. As a matter of fact, against Pepsi, what teams in the league, I pitched a double hitter on Saturday and caught a double hitter on <laughs> Sunday. And that began to take its toll. So we had to find some other ball players from the, the college, but they were only with us a, a short period of time. And eventually, uh, we couldn't afford even the East Shore Baseball League because you had to pay for umpires, you had to travel, hit by baseballs, of course, you had to buy your equipment. And uh, we just, so we lasted four years. Uh, but, and it was a strain on all the players because the league started playing during the weekdays. The majority of the people were workers. And some may get out work at 6 o'clock, some maybe at 7 o'clock. And the game would start at 7 o'clock or 6 o'clock, yeah. And the game started uh, a little late, so it was difficult. And so eventually, it, everybody was hurt and devastated, but we just forced to, to fold, really, in 1982 was our last year playing baseball. Now, the other teams that had been part of the, the Negro League earlier, what, uh, anything to say about the, the history of them from that, uh, in that period, right around that time? Sadly enough, those teams, Salisbury was the only team that I know from my youth and my adulthood that lasted any more than 15 or 20 years. Uh, I, I think, and there were very few of them that, that, that lasted, but our team just persevered and, because we had the love of the game. Baseball was all we knew. Basketball was unheard of until we got into high school. Football, we didn't know anything about football. Some ran a little track. But baseball, every young man wanted to play on Oak City's baseball team. And we work all day and practice at night uh, until it got done. And uh, this is what we did, but eventually, uh, again, we had the 4 and 8 2, but those other teams didn't last long. And so it was difficult, actually, to get a schedule. Because the team we played two years in a row, the third year, they had folded. And we traveled again all up the East Coast, as far as Cordova, and uh, the, uh, Chestertown, numerous times. But uh, Eastern, but those teams didn't last long. And so again, we were forced to join, because when we wanted to play, we joined the East Shore Baseball League and enjoyed those four years. And after our team folded, I joined the. Uh, Virginia Shores baseball team, which I played with for, for, for three years. Okay. So I was 39, but I, I had that thirst. I couldn't quit. And I had to retire when I struggled three times in a game. So I said, it's time to go. Very good. Well, that, that's what I'm hearing from everyone up here is that there's a certain, people get to a certain point where there's, there's a love of the game mm -hmm. in them, right? And it's just part of who they are. And uh, it's a major part of, uh, major part of your all's lives. So. Um, Really, I want to sort of finish with this. Each of you has done something uh, to preserve the, our understanding of the, of the history of baseball here on the Eastern Shore. And uh, if, if each of you could just comment for a minute on why you're committed to it and what you think, um, what you would want to impart to, to younger people, perhaps, that know virtually nothing about uh, older league play, a anything that you want to say that's connected to our mission of preserving this history. And uh, Mr. Davidson, we can start with you. Um, well, I, I've been, I've had the love of the game my whole life, you know, and, and uh, it started off on the, on the playgrounds. I, I grew up, I grew up with uh, a guy by the name of Barry Sparks. He used to take us to games when we didn't, we couldn't drive. He was the only one that was old enough to drive. And he would take us, we would go in his car and drive to Wilmington, catch a train to Philly, and go to Old Shy Park. And then we'd go to Memorial Stadium too. But he ended up uh, writing a lot of uh, baseball articles on the Eastern Shore League. He was, uh, um, he was an intern for uh, Bill Mowbray, who was the sports editor of the uh, uh, Daily Banner in Cambridge, and he ended up writing the book on the Eastern Shore League, this, this yep. book right here. And, uh, um, and then Barry ended up um, moving away, and eventually he wrote a book on uh, uh, Home Run Baker. It's a biography on Home Run Baker. And, uh, and then I, I, I ran across a guy named Crawford Foxwell, 
who was uh, who was a collector, and he was known over all the Mid Atlantic area as as one of the nicest. But he also was a collector that, at that time, you know, uh, you could get Babe Ruth cards for twenty five dollars. You could get. Uh, uh, we were in a. We were in a. Uh, in the 70s, 74, we were in a hotel room in, uh, we'd meet in a hotel room in Wilmington. It was called the Mid-Atlantic Sports Collectors Association. And uh, there was three guys in there that had Honest Wagner cards when there was only six known. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that was, uh, uh, it was crazy, but it just wasn't, it wasn't very, the everyday people didn't do it at that time. but. Crawford was, he was uh, quite a guy and, uh, and he, he was the first Eastern Shore League collector that I ever knew. And uh, uh, he helped me do a lot of things. And then, and then I got to know Bill Mowbray. Bill Mowbray, he's, he's given me so much stuff uh, for when he was playing in the prep leagues and stuff around Cambridge. And, uh, and he's given me everything on his book. I've got his copyrights and everything, and and uh, it just and then I got to know uh, uh, later on we were uh, I got to know Mike Lambert who, who wrote another book on the Eastern Shore League. It's uh, it's an Arcadia book, but uh, that's it. It's just uh, it's just been something that I've done my whole life, you know, and love to share it. I've got I've got that exhibit right now. In Cambridge, but it's all on Cambridge baseball. But it's it's a pretty cool exhibit. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> well, I um, like like Donnie. My baseball love goes back to as far as I can remember. Yeah. I, <clears throat> in fact, I think I basically learned how to read um, reading box scores with with my dad. You know, and I always had a love of history, so it's just a natural sort of combination. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think I really got started reading Bill Malbury's book uh, because, you know, he's writing about a certain era, and I'm thinking, well, what happened before that? You know, that, that was my question. So I was dumb enough to start reading old newspapers and, uh, and f figuring out what, what did happen and how it started. And, um, you know, and I got connected with the Society of American Baseball Research, and, you know, I got involved with some projects with them, and it's just sort of... It kept going and, and going. And, um, you know, I, I like to stress a lot of times that, the, you know, baseball history is actually more than baseball history. You, you can't talk about it without bringing something else into it, whether it's, you know, uh, culture or, or, you know, the people or how things work. or it, It's just so much more than that. It's out, you know, baseball history is outside the lines a lot of times. And uh, so... Thank you. Yeah. Well, what I remember about coaching Little League, Pony League, and American Legion, done it all, is what's rewarding is when congressmen, U.S. senators in Maryland come back that you had something to do with baseball and they still call you Mr. Evans. That makes you feel good. So that's the only thing. I enjoyed every minute I played, every minute I coached, and proud of uh, the, the kids, what they've made. Uh, of themselves, and you point them in the right direction, and um, hope they make the right decision. I was in police work for 20, 27 years, and um, so I know people. And uh, I only had one little leaguer, a pony leaguer, go bad over the forty-some years I've associated with him. So that's not a bad percentage. Pretty good. Thank you for your time. Very good, Dr. Hall. Uh, again. I find myself in a very unique uh, situation. Very few people had heard of Oaksville, except for the individuals who you've played or remember those years. There was a gentleman named Brian Laird who coaches high school baseball and said, Kirk, where can I find African-American baseball players? So since Oaksville folded, it's hard to find them. I've talked to a number of high school coaches. They tell me the same thing. 
But, and I believe because Oaksville was forced to fold and the family members that moved away with children, they started running towards basketball and, and football and other sports. And I found it uh, my responsibility, along with others, and there's a lady here who keeps reminding me that it's important to preserve the history. Her name is Clara Small, that lady with that hat on. She said, you need to preserve the history. And so I only started a few years ago uh, collecting pictures and paraphernalia and uh, old uniforms. And, and I'm, I, it just hurts me that we threw away so much information, school books and all those things that, that are lost. And I recall when I went to Ohio State in 1974, I had about 500 comic books. I left them home in the closet. And I said, Mom, please don't bother my comic books. When I returned, there were no comic books. Said she thought it was trash. Huh? Oh, oh, and baseball cards. And I said, Mama, why'd you throw all that away? Said, I thought it was trash. And so the same thing happened with Oaksville, but I've been able to glean some things, so some pictures, and I think it's important just to tell the story that there were individuals who played baseball. There were blacks who played baseball in this area, and we're good. But if someone does not keep the story going and tell the history, no one will never, ever know. So with that in mind, and other individuals pushing me all the time. It just makes me, motivate me uh, intrinsically to, to continue working, continue putting together information. And I and appreciate you uh, for your inquiry. And it, all baseball should be preserved, not just one, all, not one kind. All baseball should be preserved. And I appreciate it. Enough said. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists. We do have some time if there are uh, questions from the audience. Um, and there's a microphone up here in the front row. Some of you may not need that. So, so what, was the, what was the nature of the affiliation, in the, like say the major leagues, or with the Class B? Yeah. No, they were all sponsored. Uh, all the towns were, that had a team were sponsored by a major league team. A reminder, right. but, uh, most of the Class D on the Del Mar Peninsula. Uh, but every little town had a team. Cross Rilla started at Pocomo. Mel Parnell started at Milford. Mm. And uh, some of the greatest players who ever played the game started their career on the Delmar Peninsula. Might not have been born and raised here, but somewhere during their career passed through here playing. And uh, a lot of them never forgot it because baseball was a base, I used to show it was a baseball community. I mean, that's all it was to do then years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, I, I heard some old timers say, we were the Reach Your Boys Club Salvation Army. Many years ago, I get a little excited talk about baseball, you have to forgive me. But anyway, <laughs> there was no lights, no night game. They were playing in Salisbury, and the whole town would shut down work at noon and go watch a ball game. And when the ball game got over, they went back and finished their day's work at wherever <laughs> they were employed at. I mean, it's, uh, people didn't believe it, but it actually happened. And um, uh, like I said, I, I'm very fortunate. I, uh, late 40s and 50s, I started playing, and uh, it wasn't nothing to have 1,400, 2,000 people at Hebron when we played Crisfield, or Prince's Anne when we played Pokemon, or Delmar played Berlin, the Delmar Railroaders. Let me tell you something, they packed that place up there. I mean, it was, uh, there was nothing else to do. Now they sit home and watch television and, you know, go on boat and odd stuff. And, uh, money is a little bit more free than it was years ago. Uh, just to add something to that, huh? um, in, in the 1920s, there wasn't that tight affiliation uh, because the Landis and the minor league people did not believe in absentee ownership. I mean, they were still doing it. People were farming players out, sticking them with, with, with teams, but it wasn't formal. It was, it was uh, Ricky. Uh, Branch Ricky that sort of brought that back. So by the 1930s, that, that's when you start really seeing affiliation. Every team, uh, most teams have. 
had some kind of affiliation. Jimmy Fox, I mean, if he started in the league, did he work his way up? Uh, he didn't have to work. He didn't take. He, he did take him, but a couple of years getting yeah. the big leagues. How did, how did the team, how did the players get to the major leagues? I mean, they, they well, in the twenties, a lot of times, a team was responsible for recruiting their own players, so Easton recruited Fox. Uh, I don't know the exact story. You, you can read three or four different versions, um, but they sold him to the Athletics, and in fact, he played for. He was a bullpen catcher at the age of 16, and I think went six for nine as a pinch hitter, and then he did some time in the minor leagues and then came back. Now, later on, like say in the 30s, you might start, say, at Salisbury and then go to the Eastern League or then the International League and, and work your way up. But the 20s teams, a lot of your money was made. You had to recruit your own players and turn around and sell them. Um, so. Uh, Dr. Hall, I have a question. I think two times you mentioned women playing baseball. Uh, was it were, were there was there an organized league on the shore, or how did that uh, how did that work? I, I think that team was uh, uh, designed to just complement the the men and to bring in attendance, improved attendance. Uh, I think it may have cost what ten cent, fifteen cent, if that much, to come to a baseball game. And uh, they had the women, again, they played first, maybe two or three innings. They went home, I guess, to do cooking or whatever they needed to do, and then the, the men played. But again, I told my mother, I always said she played baseball better than all her boys. <laughs> so I never argued with that. So they were playing teams, though. Was it that were they playing the, um, the same team that no. you were playing? Was it, okay. no, no, no. Was it, it all local? As a matter of fact, the team they played did not have a baseball team. Okay. It was the Dublin women. And they played Oaksville women for bragging rights. Uh, and that's, that was one thing. They didn't play anybody else that I know of. Because okay. mother didn't mention it, but uh, no other teams. Dublin, 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 Dublin. Dublin and Oaksville. <laughs> Oaksville and Dublin. <laughs> then Dublin and Oaksville. Well, I hadn't seen any evidence of, I, 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 I mean, I did not, I wasn't aware of any <clears throat> sort of exhibition games from the, the women's league that played in the 40s, any yeah. visitation to the to the Eastern Shore, but you caught my attention with that. So I'm yeah, I, got, I think I have the names of the women on, on those uh, flowers over there. Okay, I got both tables. Great. Right. All right. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Please take a look at the exhibit over there, and if you if you have a minute to fill out that survey, we'd appreciate it. But thank you so much for coming. Let's give our panelists a hand again. <laughs> Take me out to the ball game Take me out with a crowd Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack I don't care if I never get back Let me root, root, root for the home team If they don't win, it's a shame